Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Many of you know exactly what this image is. It's a recreation of a criticality accident at Los Alamos, one that unfortunately killed Lewis Slotin. This was a demonstration colloquially known as Trickling the Dragon's Tail, where a plutonium core would be brought close to criticality by surrounding it in a sphere of beryllium, which would reflect neutrons back into the core. The sphere was in two halves, and as they brought the top sphere down, they would stop it getting too close by wedging a screwdriver in the middle. By carefully rotating the flat-bladed screwdriver, the distance between the reflector and the core could be adjusted and the reactivity changes observed. Unfortunately for Lewis, the screwdriver slipped out, the reflector got too close, the core went critical, there was a blue flash of light, and while he was able to separate the assembly by hand, by that point he had received a fatal radiation dose and would die within weeks. And these events are now so well known that the internet is full of memes about it. People with basically no idea about nuclear physics know that it's a bad idea to go messing around with the fissile core of atomic weapons. And this particular core has a real reputation because it had been involved in a previous criticality accident with a, a scientist called Harry Daglin. And he also died from a radiation dose. The core would eventually get known as the Demon Core. It would be melted down and its material incorporated into newer generations of weapons. And it's with this knowledge of a criticality accident that I watched the movie Mission Impossible Fallout, which does feature some great action scenes, in particular the fight with Henry Cavill in the bathroom, top notch. But it does feature this scene where they are trying to acquire three plutonium cores that are all nicely placed in a case together. I thought that putting three cores in such close proximity together was a criticality accident waiting to happen. In fact, I wrote a whole alternate version of that scene where a tech guy, Benji, played by Simon Pegg, took one look at it and immediately dismissed them as fake, saying nobody would be stupid enough to put three plutonium cores together in a case. And that, of course, allows for some comic relief from Simon Pegg, and who doesn't want that, right? Where, uh, no, he is he's assured that they are, in fact, for real, and that the case is lined with borated polyethylene to absorb the neutrons and reduce the criticality risk. And, of course, he's now trying to keep this at arm's length, and then there's a you know chase sequence where the pits are rolling around in the back of the car, and they're trying to stop them touching each other. Look, this could totally work. Anyway, I speculated about the criticality of this on the internet, and sure enough, the internet delivered. So this is a guy called Gavin Ridley, I guess he's like a nuclear engineer, and he understands how to do these criticality calculations. He's using a piece of software called OpenMC, that's Open Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo is basically where you use a statistical process to model like bulk properties. And in this case, what they're doing is creating billions of virtual neutrinos and having them shoot through the geometry. And sometimes they hit things and cause fission, sometimes they're absorbed, sometimes they're scattered. And you can therefore figure out the criticality of very complicated shapes. And we could actually get some really good measurements for the prop used in the movie because it turned up on a prop auction website and they presented all sorts of beautiful photos of the case from every angle. Now, using images of that case, we then figured out it was a standard Pelican case design and we could tell the cores were about 9.3 millimetres in diameter. And so using those numbers... Gavin was able to define the criticality in OpenMC and it, you know, it has a Python interface. You go in, you define your materials, you define your geometry, it uses constructive solid geometry, and then it effectively does ray tracing with neutrons, which is kind of a cool concept if you think about it. But having heard about OpenMC, I was like, I should do something with this. This sounds fun. And so there was another question that turned up in the responses about forbidden bocce or forbidden petanque. What would happen if you took two plutonium pits and essentially threw them each uh, at each other? Would they go critical? How critical would they go? And so if I were to do this simulation using the demon core, I would need to know the exact dimensions. Turns out that people have looked at this process quite a lot. Here's another paper from a couple of years ago looking at the criticality of the Lewis Slotin accident. And this one I find particularly interesting. First of all, it uses a different you know, neutron transport code, but it you know, well lays out the geometry and everything correctly, including the bodies of the people nearby, because human bodies are made of water and water acts as a neutron moderator. One of their conclusions was that the hand, the thumb extending down inside the shield, actually contributed enough to make the reaction go off. So yeah, Lewis Slotin died by his own hand.
the number that we're really interested in for these simulations is k, right? That's the criticality. And you see on the chart at the bottom, it says k effective. And basically that is your criticality. If it's above one, it's super critical. If it's below one, it's subcritical. And there is this very important gray area around one where the criticality is a result of the delayed neutrons, the reaction proceeds more slowly. Anyway, the demon core was about 8.9 centimeters in diameter and it had a 2.5 centimeter cavity in the middle for the neutron generator. It weighed about 6.2 kilograms. It was made from plutonium that was stabilized in the lower density delta phase by alloying it with gallium. The pits that we know about from history all have been made in multiple parts, so it's nice to see that groove around the outside of that. They have a hollow cavity in the middle, and the old ones it was for a neutron generator, but newer generations of weapons, it's a space where you inject like some uh, tritium and deuterium so that nuclear fusion kicks off in there, and that helps boost the yield of the weapon. So I created my simulation of nuclear bocce, with two of the demon cores placed side by side, touching each other, sitting on a concrete surface. Now, the concrete surface is important because you can get re neutron reflections coming up. The composition of the surface could be important, but I just wanted to know whether this would go critical. I also included, of course, the two and a half centimeter cavities in the middle, but those were just left empty containing air. So I let OpenMC do its thing, crunching the numbers to figure out where the neutrons would go, where the reactions would be. And we get things like the heat uh, generation, the neutron flux, and we got a criticality value of 0 0.836. So yeah, nuclear bocce would actually be safe. Well, at least until the point where you rubbed off the coatings and the plutonium began to oxidize and release, you know, basically radioactive uh, dust into the air. I'll be honest, this was actually kind of unexpected. I thought, you know, these things would easily go critical, but the more I thought about it, I realized that these pits were placed in the middle of a very large assembly, including a thick uranium tamper, which would also act as a neutron reflector. So they were significantly subcritical. And this would very likely be true of any pit designed for a weapon. But this is a game involving multiple balls, so how many would it take? Well, if we arrange them in two-dimensional patterns, three doesn't do it, four doesn't work, five doesn't work, but it gets close, six, if you lay them out correctly, that will go critical, and seven is absolutely critical. But these are two-dimensional distributions. If you stack them up like a little mini tetrahedron, well, four spheres isn't critical, but five, that is critical. And so I wanted to go back to the pits that were used in the movie because they were slightly bigger. And of course, our nuclear engineer friend had already done the geometry for us and demonstrated that it would absolutely go critical. But to be clear, he used solid pits. And I thought, what if they are hollow pits? After all, we know that hollow pits are a feature and we can expand the cavity until we get something that is subcritical until it reaches some configuration which is more dangerous. And that's when I discovered that our friend, the nuclear engineer, had made a little bit of a mistake. And to be clear, it's kind of understandable since he probably works on power and not weapons. He had the density of plutonium set to 19.84, which is the highest density of plutonium available. However, plutonium actually has multiple allotropes. That is, it forms different crystal structures with different densities. And 19.84 grams per cubic centimeter corresponds to alpha phase plutonium. But as I understand it, weapon pits prefer to use the delta phase. And that has a lower density, closer to 16 grams per cubic centimeter. And the reason for this is that as your plutonium cools, right, different sections will reach different transition temperatures. And if it contracts, then you're going to get stresses inside the structure. It will crack. So they figured that to make a nice consistent core, they had to stabilize it in the delta phase. And they do this by alloying it with gallium. But the lower density delta phase offers another advantage. In a plutonium implosion device, you're essentially squeezing that plutonium pit down with the explosive pressure. But the delta phase is only really stable up to your certain pressures. And so it's relatively easy to squeeze that delta phase into the higher density alpha phase and you get a whole bunch of compression for not a lot of uh, pressure. So if we take that lower density delta stuff and put it into the nuclear case, we get a criticality of 0.945, so it is subcritical. I apologize to the movie creators, this is totally, totally valid. 
although that does require a borated liner. That is, the plastic in the conformal liner is mixed with about 5% boron and that absorbs excess neutrons and reduces the reactivity. If we use just regular plastic, that gets me a K value of 1.001, which does push us into spicy blue flash territory. Of course, that assumes that they're solid, and since they're probably not solid, they're probably actually safe overall. So now, coming back to the concept of, uh, well, nuclear bowling, what would happen if you did actually have pits that were big enough that when you brought two of them together, they would go critical? What would happen? Would we get just like a blue flash and then some hot pits? Or would they bounce off each other with some energy as the reaction proceeded? Or would you get something that resembled an explosion, albeit something closer to a small conventional explosion rather than a full-on atomic device? Or would we get something close to a stable low-grade nuclear reactor just spitting out radiation and getting hot? You can think of it as a poorly designed gun-type device, similar to Little Boy, except not. In Little Boy, the two components of the core were pushed together at speeds comparable to that of a gun, and that, as you may know, turned out to be too slow for plutonium, forcing them to go with an implosion-type device. Whereas even in baseball, where they're throwing a 5-ounce or 150-gram ball, they're throwing it at less than 100 miles an hour. So moving at a few meters per second, they get to maybe one centimeter of each other before they go critical. And the reaction begins slowly, but once they get even closer and they go prompt critical, the reaction grows very quickly. The metal will start to heat up. And as it heats up, the pit expands and the density drops off. And so it's possible for the reaction to shut down because the expansion is lowering the density. There are other thermal effects that can slow the reaction, such as Doppler broadening, but it's possible that, yeah, you have two block, two spheres, they just come into contact, and then they pretty much, yeah, they, they find some stable reaction level. Although this could take more of the form of a, like a pulsed reactor that periodically goes off. And, you know, is there something that pushes these apart? Well, there is actually a neutron flux that goes between the two sides, and the neutrons traveling back and forth and hitting on each side are actually going to transfer momentum, but they're going to release way more energy than they are going to transfer momentum. So it's not a big effect. Heating of the air between them via gamma rays, that's also going to provide some sort of uh, reaction force pushing them apart. But if they're big enough, the stable temperature might be well above their melting points. Now, this diagram here shows the amount of heating in the objects. And you'll notice that the highest heating is actually sort of in the middle of the object, but biased towards the other object. So if these things heat up so quickly that they're effectively melting, what's going to happen is that stuff in the middle is going to melt and it's going to expand out and essentially blow out through the near side between them. It'll more or less be a bit like a rocket exhaust, except it'll be blowing chunks of plutonium everywhere. So this will probably be on the order of a small chemical explosion. Think about the amount of energy that goes into, you know, heating up and melting and then vaporizing this chunk of plutonium. That's the amount of energy you'll get out. And it's again, comparable to a chemical event rather than a nuclear explosion. It'll be like a grenade going off, except with a big blue flash. But of course, modeling such a dynamic event goes well beyond the capabilities of OpenMC, and this is mostly just like guesswork. Anyway, I wanted to look at one other sport that involves balls. That is a uh, pool. I basically tried to contrive some scenario where you could rack up the balls, and then as soon as you started playing, well, it would be blue flash time. Well, it turns out if you take regulation pool balls and make them out of alpha phase plutonium, then it's actually not enough to make them reactive. But if you make the pool table out of beryllium and make it about 3.6 centimeters thick, then you could make arguably the dumbest and most expensive assassination method ever, where yes, you have a pool table, which before the break is not critical. As soon as you take the break, it goes critical, you get a blue flash, and suddenly everybody realizes why those balls weighed almost two kilograms each. And so finally, the biggest question is, why did I do all this? I, I, I mean, I guess I was curious to see if I could simulate this kind of thing, and then I was surprised to find out that my preconceptions about the cursed bowling ball were in fact completely false. 
Because these things exist in the middle of weapons, they already have to account for the fact that neutrons are being reflected back in. They're hollow. Uh, the geometry of just smashing two spheres together is not optimal for making uh, a critical mass. And so coming back to uh, Mission Impossible Fallout, once again, yeah, it actually can work. So congratulations on that front. But there's one other example of a pit carrying case, and that is, of course, the one that was used for the Manhattan Project. So this was designed by a scientist called Philip Morrison. He went, worked with a machine shop. They basically took a piece of a block of magnesium, cut it in half, took it over to a machine to bore out a spherical cavity in the middle. And then around the outside, these are basically rubber stoppers, which they had to freeze in liquid nitrogen so they could drill holes through them and basically put bolts through the side into the case. It was painted yellow to protect the magnesium from corrosion. And there was a thermometer on top that could read the temperature interior to the case. And so, yeah, the designer of this, Philip Morrison, after the war, he returns to academia. He works in astronomy, astrophysics, works on, like, you know, co cosmic rays. And in 1977, he narrates a movie called Powers of Ten, which you've probably seen. It's an exploration of the scale of the universe from subatomic up to galactic and intergalactic scales. And if you haven't seen that classic documentary, then why have you been watching my exercise in stupidity for the last 15 minutes? I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.